and thank you dr manish uh, for the good introduction and thanks to the webinar organizers for this opportunity so the topic for uh, today's discussion is safety risk assessment and derivation of uh, safety requirements so before going to the topic uh, i will talk briefly about our company so i work for mahindra electric mobility limited which is the pioneer in of electric vehicle technology in india mahindra electric is a subsidiary of uh, mahindra group and is headquartered in bangalore our r and d center is also in bangalore and our manufacturing facilities are in bangalore and pune locations so mahindra electric has many product and vehicle platforms we have passenger car segments like e2o e2o plus and e very 2 and three wheeler segments like trio and yari so apart from our own vehicles today mahindra electric is supplying wide range of electric powertrain products to other oems worldwide so with that we will quickly go to the topic uh, so the, the agenda for today's discussion so what is a hazard and why we identify them so methods to identify hazards why we perform risk assessment what are the risk reduction measures item definition we will discuss uh, in detail about the hazard analysis and risk assessment hara and derivation of uh, safety goals which is like top level safety requirements okay <clears throat> so i guess uh, the participants are from different background right uh, in this session so like people working on system safety hardware safety software safety so you may ask hey i work for uh, i work on software safety even core control level bsw safety whether hazard analysis and asset determination matters to me well my answer is uh, it matters to you as well so basically all the safety mechanisms you implement your development your testing process and the reviews you perform so everything is decided based on this activity only so people who work on safety critical automotive system irrespective of what level you are working you should have good understanding on this topic so basically i prepared this presentation in two parts so first part covers what hazard analysis and risk assessment really means so second part with examples i hope this session will be useful for uh, specialist level to even beginner level people <clears throat> so introduction uh, in the course of my presentation you will often hear the terminologies like hazard harm item system so it, it's better to understand this terminologies first so what this terminologies means with respect to iso context so what what is a hazard so a hazard is a potential source of harm caused by malfunction behavior of the item right so this is what iso says and uh, what is a harm so it is a physical injury or damage to the health of persons an item it could be a system or combination of system to which iso is applied and it has to implement a function or specific function at vehicle level and a system it should be a set of components or systems at least you should have a sensor controller and actuator with one other so we will try to understand this terminologies with this example so you can see there are three components uh mentioned here so we have the accelerator pedal sensor motor control unit and the motor so here i have chosen the permanent magnetic synchronous motor which is one of our product <clears throat> so the the the, in, the output from the accelerator pedal sensor is used to determine the driver demanded torque request so it will be processed conditioned by this motor control unit and it will come uh, uh, <clears throat> and it will calculate the driver demanded torque and this driver demanded torque request will be provided to this motor so with this i will be able to achieve a vehicle function which is like provide positive drag torque for vehicle function right so here you have a sensor you have a controller you have an actuator so with this components so you, you can call this as a system right so you, you have a sensor control unit and an actuator so you can call this as a system so the difference between system and an item with respect to iso context is this system it has to perform a vehicle level function so here i am able to perform a vehicle function so i can call this as an item so this is what an item really means next with the same item so what is an hazard and what is an harm we will try to understand so there is a fault in the accelerator pedal sensor the fault is a sensor short to power failure so which leads to too high act pedal value and this information is received by this control unit and uh, it calculates a 
excessive torque demand and it provides the motor and the motor provides excessive torque output right so here the fault in the act pedal sensor is an the failure in the act pedal sensor is a fault and then in the motor control unit it's an error and in the motor it's a failure so with this so what it is going to cause if the motor uh, uh, erroneously provides excessive motor torque it is going to cause an excessive or unintended vehicle acceleration right so that is nothing but an hazard and if it is going to hit a person it may cause injury to the pedestrians right that is harm so so this is what iso says uh, with respect to the cascading of failures so we have to clearly understand what is an fault error failure what is an hazard and what is an harm so why why we need to clearly identify sorry so why we need to clearly understand what is an hazard because here the excessive vehicle acceleration is an hazard whereas excessive motor torque is just a failure it's not an hazard so when when you are uh, deriving when when you are analyzing the hazard on a system you should not write something like unintended abs function unintended aeb function uh, unintended uh, uh, acc function so th those are not really hazard so the hazard should always be defined at the vehicle level okay so why we basically identify hazards so as a tire one uh, supplier so during our uh safety audit and assessments uh, we will often say my system is safe right so the oem will ask how your system can be unsafe so why we basically perform a hazard analysis we need to know how how do i know my system is really safe or not we should know right so that that's the main reason for hazard analysis and also in what ways my system can be unsafe so this also can be determined by the hazard identification basically this hazard identification help also helps the system designer to identify the potential unsafe behavior of the system also this hazard identification helps to remove avoid or mitigate those behaviors as well and this, this hazard identification is a very important activity so it's the starting point of all safety activities and all the subsequent safety activities trace back to the hazard analysis so next so what are the steps involved in hazard analysis so if you look at iso part 3 I didn't clearly mention the step-by-step -step procedure of hazard analysis. So this is uh, so this flowchart is based on the methodology we follow in our organization, right? So first, in the the starting point of hazard analysis, you have to first collect the item definition information. So in the upcoming slides, I have captured what are the informations uh, we need to have in item definition. So next, you have to select an appropriate team. So my suggestion is uh, at least the team should have three members. So people uh, with safety knowledge, system knowledge, and domain knowledge should be part of the team. At least three member team should be there. And you have to select uh, the appropriate methods to identify hazards. So I have captured in the next slide, what are the uh, available methods to identify hazards? So once you have chosen the applicable methods, you have to identify the hazards, or you have to review the benchmark information. So it could be, the information available from the reference project or there are some standards available right some SAE standards are available you can refer those informations and you can identify the hazards with that and you have to document uh, the list of hazards in the template and the next importantly you have to document all the assumptions you rely on so why uh, you have to document the assumptions are basically uh, when you are starting hazard analysis you will have some assumptions at vehicle level system level also when you are progressing with your hazard analysis, you will have additional uh, assumptions. Also, at the end of hazard analysis, uh, you will have a list of assumptions. So you have to clearly document those assumptions, and you have to cascade those assumptions uh, to the respective system team or to an OEM. So this is also very important. <clears throat> so what are the methods uh, for identifying hazards? So there are so different methods available. So first one is uh, benchmarking. Uh, so this is uh, like there is an SAE standard SAE J2980. So you can refer uh, this standard uh, as a starting point uh, uh, for hazard analysis. So basically, if you look at this SAE J2980 standard, it, it has uh, some hazard analysis information related to uh, powertrain system, braking system, steering system. So you, you 
you can take that as a starting point of your analysis next one is brainstorming uh, so you have to have a team and uh, brainstorm with the team like how to identify the hazards so next one function hazard analysis so in our organization we call this as function failure analysis we also use uh, this methodology to identify hazards so this is a, a quite powerful uh, analysis methodology and it is very useful to identify hazards related to control systems <clears throat> and the most uh, known one hazard hazard and uh, operability analysis uh, so most of us know this methodology like uh, you will have a set of guide words and you will apply those guide words uh, to the functions uh, and you will postulate the malfunction behaviors right <clears throat> so the next one uh, so the next method is uh, supplied by customer the customer or an oem um, may flow down the hazards to suppliers right but for this you have to be really lucky and normally an oem or a customer uh, will not provide uh, the hazards to you so most of the time the tire one supplier has to perform the hazard but yeah so it can be supplied by a customer as well <clears throat> okay next uh, one important topic like uh, an important and interesting one like hazards unrelated to malfunctions so this is based on uh, our project experience like basically hazards are nothing but uh, they are the results of malfunctions right you should you need to have an e failure in your system and the e failure uh, leads to a hazard even if you look at iso so iso specifically scopes hazards are those related to malfunctions right the definition of function set itself is uh, absence of unreasonable risk due to the malfunction behavior of uh, IE systems right but so in our experience uh, we have seen uh, that uh, the hazards may also arise uh, even the systems are working correctly so i have captured few examples so as a safety uh, system safety response rules uh, uh, you have to also consider these scenarios uh, in your hazard analysis the first example uh, is uh, because of emergent behavior between two functioning items if a vehicle or function is achieved by two different items so there is a possibility of uh, hazard even though the items are functioning correctly so one example i can say is uh, so in our electric vehicle development uh, maybe in electric vehicle all of us know if driver presses brake pedal the braking is done by combined braking of powertrain and friction brakes right the situation we came across is uh, if there is a slippery surface even the medium braking by the driver can lock the wheels so if there is a wheel locking all of us know the abs function uh, in braking system will kick in and it will unlock the wheels otherwise it will cause a lateral instability loss but this particular use case uh, abs function cannot help us because the abs can only reduce the brake pressure the electric powertrain electric torque is still there so we developed safety concept to resolve this issue so if you look at this example there is no malfunction in any of the e systems both the systems are working perfectly fine but a vehicle function if it is achieved by two different systems there can be a possibility of hazard and we have to address those aspects as well in your hazard analysis so the next one uh, is because of item used in a different manner to original intent so here uh, one example is uh, so in modern cars uh, the mechanical hand brake lever is replaced by electric park brake function even you can find this feature in our mahindra ultra g4 vehicle so there will be epb button at the instrument cluster so if the driver wants to park the vehicle he has to press the button and it will lock the rear wheels or the front it is based on where the uh, park brake calipers are fitted so uh, then the motors are fitted so and this function will work only during standstill speed like speed less than 5 kph so the oem decided to use this feature as a secondary breaker function like if there is a failure in the bra primary brake circuit so this function has to come as a backup so later uh, we witnessed that uh, there is a high chance that uh, the vehicle user may try to use this function uh, instead of applying brake pedal since it is very easy for him to access the button epb button and if he do so uh, and if he is driving on a low mu surface uh, and if he is applying the epb button to uh, decelerate his vehicle it will cause a severe problem so we address uh, so we develop safety concept to address this issue as well so you have to also consider that if you have a functionality uh, in an item this item can be used in a different manner so you have to also consider that in your hazard analysis 
so next one uh, one interesting one is uh, because of poor human interface so this situation also we came across in one of our 42 volt ev program uh, so we changed the gear lever to gear knob uh, so in if the vehicle user wants to change the gear he has to just rotate the knob so there will not be any gear lever so the gear knob will be there in the instrument cluster along with the ac knobs audio adjustment and other knobs right so we realized that during driving the user un may unintentionally adjust the gear knob so trying to when he is trying to adjust the audio he may accidentally try to adjust the uh, gear knob feature as well so like if this happens instead of a uh, forward drive uh, you may set reverse drive or uh, if, uh, even it may sometimes cause unintended braking also and uh, we also consider this aspect in the hazard analysis and we develop safety concept data so here also if you see there is no failure because of poor human interface uh, even uh, there is a possibility of a hazard so next one is because of implications of the intended functionality uh, so i think most of us uh, will have and will be able to relate to this topic uh, so address, to address this issue we have something called sortif like iso 21448 is there but the problem is uh, mostly we apply sortif uh, only for level 2 and above adas functionalities but we have to be uh, careful that even level 0 and level 1 vehicle function also has this implications so we have seen uh, in our projects so i am not <clears throat> so here i am not asking uh, you to apply sortif uh, for even level 0 and level 1 vehicle but we have to consider this aspects in our hazard analysis to some extent <clears throat> so the the conclusion here is uh, the hazard identification process uh, must do more than just consider all functions so this point i really wanted to emphasize here so we understood what is hazard analysis so what are the terminologies involved uh, in hazard analysis next we have to go for risk assessment so what is a risk so this is from iso like uh, it is risk is a combination of the probability of occurrence of harm and the severity of the harm so from this wording it is very clear like what is risk means uh, so why we really need to perform a risk assessment so basically we need to perform risk assessment uh, to prioritize which hazards need the most effort right so your asil determination we know the asil ratings are from asil a to asil d where asil d means the most stringent asil a means the least stringent so if your hazard analysis results with an hazard uh, with asil a rating which means you have to put more effort with respect to system development hardware development and software development so you have to prioritize which hazards need the most effort for that you need to uh perform the risk assessment also to identify the hazards that the tracker no further effort like the hazard analysis results with qm so you need not to perform any safety measures right so basically you need to understand okay what are the hazards applicable in my system and uh, do we need to put any effort for this or not and next one is provide information to help assess our architecture so say for example uh, to fulfill the acceleration functionality i may need one accelerated pedal sensor i would have considered only one accelerated pedal sensor in my architecture but uh, if the hazard analysis related to excessive acceleration i need to fulfill i need if it could be asil b to asil d uh, hazard excessive vehicle acceleration can be so for that i may i not be able to fulfill this with a single accelerated pedal sensor i may need to have an redundant uh, sensor so so basically this will also help in uh, means this risk identification will help in accessing our architecture as well also this helps in selecting our development process so we can try to understand uh, with this example like if you look at from part 4 or part 5 or part 6 iso has clearly given the framework like uh, how if it is an asil d uh, system so what are the development things implementation things a uh, testing aspects and the review aspects you have to consider so for example the, uh, if uh, you need to perform a hardware integration testing to verify uh, the correctness of your hardware safety requirements if you are working if you, if your risk assessment results with asil b the fault injection testing is recommended only like if you have proper rationale you need not to perform this but if it results with asil d it is highly recommended you have to perform so this risk, risk assessment helps in selecting our development process as well and also it helps uh, in planning the budgets and time scales because uh, if it is an asil d you need to have 
additional testings, uh, additional safety analysis you need to perform, additional development measures you have to take care. So it will have an impact in your budget and time scale. So these are the main aspects uh, of our risk assessment. So, this a... <clears throat> so next topic, uh, risk reduction measures. Um, actually, uh, by taking certain measures, uh, we can even reduce the risks. So I have captured a few examples um, based on our project. Uh, so these are the measures to reduce risk. Like uh, you can even eliminate the hazard. Uh, by eliminating the hazard, uh, you can reduce the risk. So one example is uh, we plan to introduce uh, this hill hold function through electric powertrain in one of our 48 volt systems. So basically what this function does is uh, in standstill if the driver takes off like from the brake pedal to press the accelerator, there will be a rollback. So this function will hold the vehicle for some time to avoid rollback. In Hara analysis, we came to know that this function introduces two additional hazards like uh, uh, unintended vehicle hold or too low vehicle hold. To fulfill this function in powertrain, it demanded additional safety interfaces, but the, those were tough to achieve. So we moved, to, we moved this functionality to the braking supplier because the braking supplier also already has the hold related functionalities. So in this way, a hazard is eliminated from an EPT system. Otherwise, if the hill hold function has to be implemented in powertrain, uh, it would have resulted in additional hazard and uh, it, it was quite difficult to achieve it. So, so this is one example to eliminate the hazard. There are other uh, measures are also available to eliminate the hazard. And the other one is uh, reduce the probability of occurrence. So by reducing the probability of occurrence, uh, uh, you, you, you can reduce the risk. So let's take airbag function. So it poses two hazards, right? Loss of airbag function and unintended uh, airbag function. So here, uh, loss of airbag function, if you do a risk assessment, it will result in SLA only because you need a crash scenario for the hazardous event, uh, for, for the hazardous event to take place. And the probability of occurrence of crash scenario during a vehicle lifetime will be very low. So in this way, you can consider the probability of occurrence consideration can reduce your risk. And the next aspect is uh, increased controllability. So this is quite understandable. Like uh, for example, the excessive vehicle acceleration. When I am performing hazard analysis uh, for excessive vehicle acceleration uh, in EPT system, so this excessive vehicle acceleration from EPT system can be mitigated by driver by pressing the brake pedal. Right. So here, availability of brake function increases the controllability. So in that way, you can try to reduce the risk. Uh, mitigate severity of failures. Uh, like. So one aspect with respect to severity is uh, severity increases with speed. So if you look at most of the driverless car program uh, considers a medium speed vehicle because with the reduction of speed, uh, you will have reduced uh, collision velocity. So in that aspect, you can have a reduced risk. And uh, warnings to driver when the failure occurs. So this as aspect also helps in risk reduction. For example, uh, failure of an electric parkway function, if it is detected and informed to the driver with appropriate warning, uh, during vehicle drive during vehicle driving so in this way uh, the hazard related to vehicle parking can be avoided right so because the epp function is needed when you are trying to park the vehicle but if you are able to identify the fault during drive itself and if you are going to inform the driver the driver can be away from the risk and uh, <coughs> procedures and trainings so th 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 so we in as a electric high, as a high voltage uh, power train supplier uh, we most of the times we rely on this methodology like procedures and training because all of us know electric vehicles pose a significant high voltage exposure hazard. So OEMs normally provides a service manual and extensive training for the first responders and the service personnel to handle high voltage connectors. So in this way, the hazard related to servicing can be avoided. So the training and procedures also helps in reducing the risk. So in summary, <coughs> the hassles are both a measure of uh, risk with no mitigation and uh, risk required risk reduction. So these are the two aspects of uh, ASIL. Uh, so in summary, the points we discussed, like we have a baseline risk. So if you add a function uh, to a system, the risk will be added uh, by the system. By taking any of this risk reduction measures, you can reduce the risk and you can even try to 
bring the risk to a reasonable level. So next, <clears throat> item definition. So item definition is nothing but it's a description of uh, what we are really developing. Like we have to define the scope uh, description of the items. So, so in item definition, you have to define what is the functionality of the item. So what are the major uh, issues, sensors, and actuators involved in the item? What are the limits uh, uh, in using it? And what are its interactions? Like you will be defining the elements, uh, uh, sensors, switches, everything, right? You have to define the interactions also in the item definition and the environment aspects, everything you need to consider. So my uh, request is like, you should perform the item definition at the very early stage, even before the hazard identification. So in my experience, I have seen like people perform item definition along with the safety case preparation just to or just for a documentation purpose. So that is not the best thing because item definition you have to do as early as possible. So why you have to do it? <coughs> so without a proper de uh, item definition, uh, we will not clearly know what we are really analyzing and building. Right? Uh, so what is my scope? Uh, so what is an other tire one supply scope? So all those things you can define with a proper item definition only. And also, it plays a item definition plays a key role in distributed development. Uh, so, like, if you are a tire one supplier, uh, there are most of the chances that you may be developing a hara safety goals, or the hara and safety goals will be provided by the uh, customer, and you will be working on FSR TSR level, and you will outsource uh, the software safety requirements part and development part to some other tire two suppliers, right? So, in if you have a distributed development there item definition plays a key role because without uh, it how do you know that we are analyzing and building the same thing so we have to have clarity on this so that's where item definition plays a key role so what are the inputs uh, to item definitions so this is based on our experience like uh, so the workshops with customer uh, the out outcomes of the workshops can be considered as an input for item definition and the overview from a uh, customer like uh, during the kickoff meetings uh, and other things like the overview of the item and the functionalities can be understood. The information from past project, like if there is a reference project available. Uh, specification from uh, customer, uh, like uh, the vehicle requirements provided by the customer can also be considered as an input for item definition. Engineering imaginations, uh, so what I'm saying is like if I'm planning to develop a motor control unit, uh, it is very evident that the motor control unit needs a motor, uh, needs a resolver, it needs a phase current sensor, it's a DC uh, voltage sensor and current sensors, right? So you, you have to consider all those aspects in your item. So sometimes you can consider the engineering imaginations as well. And the standards, uh, like if you can refer maybe the part three, like what needs to be captured in item definition. And the engineering sketches, uh, like uh, if it is a pilot project and you don't have any reference project, it's very, uh, some, it's very difficult to have a proper visio or an interface architect kind of a diagram. So we have a rough sketches or even all those things also considered uh, in the item definition document. So what should be the content <coughs> of item definition? Uh, so basically we have to define the elements of the item, the elements of the item in the sense, uh, uh, basically what are the sensors you have, what are the different kinds of sensors you have, the switches, uh, the controllers, the actuators, and basically all the elements along with their uh, uh, relationship. So that needs to be defined. And description of the required functionalities, like what we expect from the item. What are the functionalities uh, 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 we are achieving at the vehicle also? That has to be defined. And assumptions about uh, requirements on other partners, uh, like uh, say for example, if. Uh, in the MCU development, I expect the other systems of, like a vehicle control unit or the battery management system or the ESP or the braking system uh, to provide certain informations. Like I expect vehicle speed information from uh, yeah, braking system. I expect uh, driver demand torque request from ECU system with the required ASIL, with the uh, required E2E integrity. So all those requirements I need to capture in the item definition document. And uh, operational uh, and uh, environmental constraints also need to be defined. And legal requirements, uh, like uh, if you need to follow any, you need to comply any, if the item need to comply any requirements like EC standards, uh, I, um, any IEC, uh, AEC standards, like you have to define those in the item definition. 
if there is a reference project available uh, so you can even define the known failure modes and the hazards in the item definition document okay <clears throat> next uh, hazard analysis and risk assessment so basically all of us know the risk classification is performed uh, based on this activity only so so in this phase, so each identified hazards, uh, so you will be uh, relating with the three parameters, severity, exposure, and controllability. From that, uh, you will be defining the automotive safety integrity level, which is ACID. So with that, you will be developing the safety goals. So there are four uh, ACID classes, ACID A, B, C, and D, uh, where ACID D means uh, it's the most stringent, very risky. So ACID A means uh, least stringent, lesser risk. So if if your hazard analysis and risk assessment results with QM, which means a quality management, so you need not to have any uh, safety activities to be followed. The existing quality management uh, process uh, in your organization is sufficient to meet this requirement. Like you may be following IATF 16949 and certain quality management practices. So like that is sufficient to fulfill this requirement. Whereas as A to D means it is safety critical. And uh, I want to uh, I want to show certain important points we need to consider in hazard analysis. So the, this point, like we already know, the hazard analysis assessment should be based on item definition because the same item definition we have to use at the FSR TSR level as well. And uh, also, like you have to define hazards always at the vehicle level. That example also we have seen. <clears throat> so most of the times uh, for beginners we will be confused. Uh, like the item without internal safety mechanisms uh, should be considered in hazard analysis. Okay. What I'm trying to say is, if I am analyzing hazard uh, uh, with respect to unintended vehicle acceleration or excessive vehicle acceleration, I should not consider rational like uh, I have two accelerated pedal sensor and I have a plausibility check between these two sensors. So it is impossible that excessive vehicle acceleration cannot happen at vehicle. You should not bring all those rationals in the hazard analysis. You should not consider any internal safety mechanisms in the hazard analysis. You should consider the external measures. You can consider the ex external measures uh, in performing hazard analysis. The external measures in the sense, same excessive vehicle acceleration hazard if I am considering. So the excessive vehicle acceleration hazard, it is always uh, caused by electric power. Most of the time it will be caused by electric power and only, right? So when you are performing a risk assessment for this, you, you can consider, I have a brake pedal function and the brake pedal function and the braking function has subsequent independence. So if the driver, if there is an excessive acceleration, the driver can apply brake pedal to control the vehicle. So that rationale you can bring in the uh, HARA analysis. So you can consider external measures, not the internal safety mechanisms uh, within the item. Uh, so next point, uh, next important point we have to consider is uh, the consequence of hazardous event shall be identified. Like if malfunction behavior of one item induces uh, the loss of several functions of the other item. So this is uh, quite difficult. Like if your tire own uh, supplier performs a hazard analysis, this is quite difficult to uh, bring it at the initial phase. So basically what I'm saying is, uh, so let's say braking system. The braking system uses a wheel speed sensor uh, to calculate the vehicle speed and uses uh, the same wheel vehicle speed information for its internal control functions. Also, most of the other uh, systems uh, in vehicle could be steering or airbag or powertrain. It also needs uh, the vehicle speed information. It could be a chance that the braking system may need a vehicle speed with SLB integrity, but whereas an electric powertrain or airbag system needs uh, the same with SLD integrity. So if you are not considering this aspect in the hazard analysis, or maybe at the B sample, C sample, Stage if uh, the OEM comes and tell you that hey I need a vehicle speed information with acid D it will end up in end up in conflict. So it's better to perform a hazard analysis along with the customer the, along with the customer in the sense once the hazard analysis is done basically just to have a review and also this is one important thing um, better to get the hazard uh, report from the customer as well because he would have considered all these aspects in his hazard analysis. Next, uh, important terminology is like uh, situation analysis. So there are two important parameters in situation analysis. One is operation situation, other one is operate, operating mode. 
So what operation situation means? So it is nothing but a scenario that can occur during a vehicle life. Like a vehicle driving in a highway, a vehicle driving in an urban environment, a vehicle parked on a slope, vehicle given for maintenance. So these are all operation situation of a vehicle. What is an operating mode? Uh, operating mode is the is like a condition of functional st state of the item. Say for example, if a driver applying accelerated pedal, driver applying brake pedal, uh, vehicle put in for charging, uh, vehicle off, vehicle uh, ignition on, all these are operating mode. So basically in situation analysis, you have to consider operation situation and operating mode. <clears throat> so this, um, so, this, this image I have taken from SE J2980. So you, you can see uh, here this particular chart, like different operation situations are considered. This uh, content we used for our hazard analysis as well. Basically, like uh, you will have different operation situations considered based on locations, uh, road conditions, driving maneuvers, uh, vehicle state, and other things. Like in the different operation situations in the sense, like driving in a highway, uh, city road, high mu, low mu surfaces. Uh, driving forward reverse uh, vehicle parked condition uh, vehicle with pedestrian moving condition uh, fully laden vehicle or partially laden vehicle all these aspects uh, need to be considered so next <clears throat> one terminology we need to understand is hazardous event hazardous event is nothing but uh, it's a combination of a hazard and an operational situation so let's try to understand uh, hazardous event with this example like hazardous event as i mentioned it's the combination of hazard plus operation situation uh, the hazard can be like unintended acceleration or unintended deceleration. The operation situation, let's consider cranking. Cranking is nothing but ignition on, creeping, like uh, you will have default torque in your vehicle, right? When you are lift off uh, your brake pedal, like you will have, you will easily attain 5 to 7 kp speed with that uh, default torque. So that is creeping. So driving in a motorway. So these three are the operation situations. Let's understand hazard analysis with this. So unintended deceleration is nothing but unintended braking. Right. So if unintended braking, if it happens uh, during cranking, like when you are doing ignition on, there is an unintended braking happens. What will happen? Nothing. Nothing will happen. Right. But the same unintended braking, if it happens uh, during creeping, like if you are traveling at five to seven kph speed, if the unintended braking happens, there will be a little bit jerk will be there, but there won't be any risk. Right. But the, if the same unintended braking, if it happens on a highway or a motorway, then it will become serious. So here we have we have to understand a hazard will not pose risk always. A hazard will pose risk based on an operation situation only. So which is nothing but an hazardous event. So ideally we should consider each hazard with each of the operation scenarios. So the operation scenarios I have captured in the previous image. So you have to consider uh, each hazards with that operation scenarios to understand the uh, hazardous event applicable to your item. So <clears throat> few more examples related to operation analysis, uh, operation situation analysis. So when you are deriving operation situation or op when you are uh, creating operation scenario, you have to consider these aspects, like what is the action of the driver, environment, road conditions, and the visibility. The example I have taken like uh, driving in an urban environment, so road condition low mu night so if i sum all this uh, i will get an operation scenario like driving in urban environment at night on low mu surface similarly like day driving means uh, it will vary the operation scenario will vary right and for a high mu surface uh, with the night driving also it's, it could be a different scenario <coughs> here i want to contradict uh, so here i will be contradicting my previous uh, statement uh, like previously i mentioned uh, a hazard will not be always risky. Uh, a hazard will be will pose a risk based on the operation scenario uh, situation. So you have to consider each hazard for all the operation situations. So in our experience, uh, you can't do that always because analyzing every hazard against an operation situation, it will be very difficult to manage, and uh, you will definitely lose uh, momentum and enthusiasm in performing hazard analysis. So my uh, the question here is like uh, you properly review the operation scenarios and you pick the appropriate ones based on your system. 
like for for example if i am working on epas uh, system electric power assisted uh, st steering uh, the below operation situation is of the more interest for me right like vehicle speed uh, like whether it's a slow speed or medium speed or fast the road geometry like whether i am going in a straight driving or a bent or sharp bent is there or surface conditions like low mu high mu so these are all of more interest i need not to uh, consider uh, something like a, what if uh, the epa system fails uh, with the parked vehicle what if, if the epa system failed uh, during vehicle charging all those aspects i need not to consider i can directly re uh, remove those operation situa situation so next <clears throat> uh, we have to understand uh, the risk graph so basically the risk uh, graph uh, is the combination of three parameters severity exposure and controllability so severity so you can refer you, you you will get more details on these parameters in ISO part 3. So severity is an estimate of extent of harm to one or more individuals during the hazardous event. So exposure right, is the state of being in an operation situation. So controllability is nothing but is the ability of a driver uh, or a road user uh, to avoid a specific harm. Um, <clears throat> let's try to understand severity parameter in detail here. So this will be most frequently asked question hey uh, like while assessing severity uh, whether i should only consider the driver inside the vehicle or some other persons also i should consider my answer is you should consider the persons at risk the people at risk like you should consider the driver of the host vehicle the passengers and other road users as well the other road users what i'm saying is uh, it could be a bicyclist or it could be a pedestrian or it could be a person sitting in other vehicle uh, as a driver or could be a passenger so you have to consider all these people in your severity parameter also you should in severity severity parameter doesn't consider the economic and environmental aspects of the harm that also we have to be clear and uh, severity mostly it is dependent on two factors one is what is the type of collision and what is the relative speed between the collision participants like whether it's head-on collision, rear end collision, or side impact. So the type of collision matters to severity. Also, the relative speed uh, between the collision participants uh, matters with severity. So this uh, table is from standard, like severity, there are, uh, it ranges from S0 to S3, where S1 means light and moderate injuries. Uh, S3 means uh, life-threatening injuries, like fatal, uh, survival is uncertain. So if there is a malfunction in a system and if the malfunction results in a hazard and if you are in a, a particular operation situation where it can cause a hazardous event if the hazardous event is going to cause a life-threatening injury and if the survival is uncertain you can rate it as s3 so basically uh, for road user the injury risk increases if the collision speed increases like if the collision speed is very high there, uh, there is a definite chance that the uh, the risk level the injury level also will be very high so this is again from sa standard like you can consider this as a starting point uh, based on the collision type considering the different uh, items in the vehicle like uh, based on the steering braking powertrain so they consider what should be the minimum speed and maximum speed to rate severity for example, if it's a front-end collision, uh, you should at least need a minimum uh, speed more than 40 to 60 kp speed to rate a particular hazard as S3. So you can consider this as a starting point uh, for your hazard analysis. So this is from the standard uh, part three. So it, from this table, uh, we will we will be able to understand what, what the S1 means, S3 means to high level. There are no very detailed uh, examples defined in standard. Say, for example, you can define S1 uh, for a scenario like if it, there is a rear or front end collision with another vehicle, if it is a very low speed, you can rate S1. But for the same uh, hazardous event, uh, if there is a medium speed, you can rate it as S3. So, so that so this uh, so this table you can also use as a starting point to understand the severity aspect. So next one is exposure. <clears throat> so exposure also one very basic thing what we have to understand is uh, the exposure is always being in the operation scenario, not the hazardous event. Like 
operation scenario what i am referring is uh, what what is the probability of a person driving in an urban environment what is the probability of a person driving in a freeway that aspect only you have to consider in exposure you should not consider the hazardous event the hazardous event like what is the probability of unintended acceleration to happen in an urban environment that aspect you should not consider in exposure <clears throat> so basically exposure is always a quite complicated uh, topic because you need to have if you, you need to have very good understanding on the, the traffic profiles the culture of uh, driving the road conditions and the driving styles of of the particular uh, market you are launching your product uh, you need to refer different sources to understand this say for example if i am uh, <clears throat> performing hazard analysis with respect to excessive acceleration uh, the excessive acceleration i am considering uh, the operation situation i need not to consider uh, like highway because a uh, i need not to consider the operation scenario of uh, a pedestrian uh, like you are driving your vehicle in a highway with a pedestrian crossing in front of you if there is an unintended vehicle acceleration happens uh, what what will be the concern i need not to analyze this for a us based market because it is very unlikely that in a highway uh, there will be a pedestrian crossing uh, whereas if i am launching the same item in india it is very likely that in a highway you can experience a pedestrian crossing highway so you have to consider that aspects in your hazard analysis so this traffic profiles and the driving style the road conditions these are uh, really this plays a key role uh, in defining the exposure also you should not consider like um, the number of vehicles uh, equipped with the item so that aspect also you should not consider in exposure so for example i you should not bring uh, a rational like uh, so every year in india 1 lakh uh, new vehicles are registered so we have only 10% market share like only 10000 vehicles uh, sold uh, by our organization so are the vehicles fitted uh, by <clears throat> with our item you should not bring those rational you should not consider the number of vehicles fitted then what should be considered <clears throat> for uh, exposure assignment so i so given two strategy either you can define an exposure based on frequency or you can define an exposure based on duration uh, we, we can see this in detail uh, in the next slide so basically the ex, uh, exposure rating varies from e0 to e4 uh, where e1 means uh, the operation situation it, uh, there is a very low probability of the operation situation whereas e4 means uh, the operation situation is highly probable there is high chance that you will be at the specific situation so as we discussed before there are two uh, parameters to define exposure uh, exposure based on duration and exposure based on frequency how to choose exposure type so let's uh, understand this uh, with this example so we know there is a airbag function in vehicle right so there are two hazards uh, posed by airbag function unintended uh, airbag firing and loss of uh, airbag firing let's consider this hazard like loss of uh, airbag firing so loss of airbag firing uh, in the sense uh, uh, the airbag function didn't deploy when it is needed <coughs> so we know the function of airbag uh, is to reduce injury to of the occupants during crash right so on a lighter note uh, so this is one function uh, where we will pay some lakhs to get the function in our vehicle but we don't want to see the function in our lifetime so so for this function means for for the airbag function to come in you need to have an accident like accident with you need to have an accident but the accident with the airbag firing is very rare right like it, it is not very frequent it it, it occurs uh, once in a lifetime or twice in a lifetime so when you are analyzing a hazard like this like loss of airbag function so here we have to understand that there should be a pre existing ie fault should be there like there should be a fault in the airbag function already which makes the airbag function to fail and you need an crash scenario then only it will uh, be a hazardous event the malfunctioned airbag could be there when you bought the vehicle the crash scenario would, would have happened after 5 years so here i cannot apply duration based here i should only apply frequency based one because the frequency metric will be the most appropriate one appropriate one a failure uh, with a crash event it is very low probable so here i can consider e1 for this 
Whereas if you take the same hazard function, uh, same uh, airbag function, unintended airbag firing. So unintended airbag firing means uh, the airbag de deploys without any reason. There is no crash, nothing because of a systematic failure or random head or failure. The airbag deploys unintentionally. So unintended means it could happen any any time. So you have to consider all driving situations and speed. So when you are analyzing a hazard related to this, your duration metric will be the most appropriate one because you need to have a malfunction and you need to have a hazard within a specific time window for the hazard event to happen because the unneeded airbag firing happens uh, you need to have a vehicle in front within a shorter time or you need to have a barric uh, divider near you something like that. within a shorter period of time this can cause an uh, hazardous event so here the duration metric will be the most appropriate one so here so this is how you have to uh, distinguish so when you have to go for a frequency based when you have to go for a duration based so again <clears throat> so the standard has given a few examples uh, in part 3 so th this particular table is for uh, duration based uh, exposure uh, so if there is a chance that you will be at an operation situation for more than 10% of your average operating time you can rate it as e4 say for example driving in a highway driving on a country road so definitely you will be spending more than 10% of your uh, average operating time in that case you can rate it as uh, e4 but if uh, there is a chance that less than 1% of uh, operating time only if you will be at a specific situation means then you can rate it as e2 like trailer attached with your car uh, so that that will be like very low probability you will not be always connecting your trailer with your car right? so in india most of us are not <coughs> using trailers but in european customers and us markets uh, the cars are also used to pull the trailers right so it is a very low probability so like less than one percent of uh, average operating time also this example is uh, based on frequency like uh, how frequently you will be at a op specific operation situation so frequency uh, it, it is based on like uh, if an operation situation you, you will face almost every drive cycle means you can rate it as e4 but uh, if um, the particular operation situation will happen less few times a year means you can rate e2 so it is based on frequency for example driving in reverse this is highly probable like when you are driving most of the driving cases you will be driving in reverse so then in that case you can rate e4 this is a very high level example the standard has given so next one is the controllability parameter so as we discussed already the controllability is the ability of the people at risk to control the situation so that they can avoid the harm so in controllability uh, whose uh, control situation need to be considered this is also one of the question frequently asked like you should consider the ability of the driver like the host vehicle to steer or brake to avoid action this aspect can be considered for controllability also the ability of other drivers uh, to steer brake to avoid action this also can be considered uh, for controllability so for controllability parameter even uh, this statement is from the standard uh, so most of the time during our safety audit and assessment I mean safety meetings with uh, customers uh, they will ask uh, what if uh, my driver is not experienced uh, there is an excessive acceleration case uh, he will not know that uh, to apply brake pedal to avoid this harm all those we should not consider all those like we expect uh, the person using the vehicle he has appropriate driver training which is like he is holding a driving license and he is in appropriate condition to drive like he is not under the influence of all all those things are not considered in the control like we expect the driver to be in appropriate condition to drive so with that understanding if there is a malfunction in the e system what will be the hazard and what will be the hazardous event so that is the scope of hazard analysis okay we can't always consider the worst case thing of the driver and all. <clears throat> so what are the different uh, classes of severity so there will be Z c0 to c3 c1 means uh, simply controllable c3 means uh, difficult to control so iso also has defined given some examples like uh, you can rate c3 if uh, there is a less than 90 percent of the driver if there is a hazardous event and if the hazardous event will be able to control by the driver like one the less than 90 percent of the driver will be able to control the hazardous event if that is the case then you can rate c3 uh, say for example if there is a malfunction and if the malfunction causes an lane, lane deviation like unintended yaw movement uh, is induced in the vehicle then you can 
even an f1 driver would be difficult to control those situations so you can, in that aspect you need to consider c3 only whereas uh, c1 means simply control like more than 99 percent of the driver will be able to easily avoid the harm maybe one example is uh, like remove arm from window right so most of our cars are fitted with power windows uh, and the driver is trying to control the win, uh, buttons during the times some of the passenger putting his hand so if the window is lifting he can easily take his hand right so it is this particular risk or the harm, harm is simply controllable so with this three parameters severity exposure and controllability based on this three parameters only the seal is determined uh, so if you can see here if you are hara analysis results with s3 for an hazard and the exposure results in e4 and the controllability is c3 then you will that is the only case you will get acidity so the different uh, severity exposure and controllability class uh, you will get different uh, acid ratings so what so we can try to understand or interpret this iso table uh, like this basically what the iso is trying to say is so if there is a malfunction and if it is going to cause an hazardous event and if the hazard is going to cause a severe injury or death scenario and the chances of uh, an user to be at a particular operation situation is also very highly probable and there are no controllability left to the driver then it will be a very high risk but by playing in with any of these parameters you can try to reduce the risk this we have seen uh, in the previous slides like what are the different risk reduction measures are available so by taking those any of those actions you can try to even reduce the risk during your hazard analysis itself so that you can have a lesser SL target given at the system level, subsystem, subsystem level, hardware and software levels. <clears throat> so what are the contents we have covered so far? Like what are the steps involved in hazard analysis, methods for identifying hazards, item definition, our analysis. We understood what is operation situation, what is an ISO 26262 risk graph. Now we will go to the main topic. So we will try to understand this with specific examples. So I have <clears throat> provided an example from our electric powertrain uh, system. So Mindland Electric Electric Powertrain as a product uh, is comprised of uh, five different systems. In function safety aspect, it's five different items. So this is one of our, uh, this is our simplified electric powertrain architecture. So the electric powertrain as a product is comprised of, as I mentioned, five different systems. So we have the vehicle control unit, motor control unit, power clock unit, battery management system, dc dc converter and uh, it has interface like this so each uh, system it has specific function at vehicle level so each of the systems are qualified to be an item so in our particular uh, session in, in this session i have taken an example from the motor control unit uh, so this motor control unit what it does is it controls the electric motor torque speed and voltage so okay so as i mentioned like before starting the hazard analysis you should define the item you should have the item definition document ready so i have captured few examples from item definition document first you have to define the mcu interface and its functions so my mcu interface looks like this here you can see uh, my mcu is interfaced with the toll volt supply it is interfaced with the battery management vcu uh, uh, systems uh, and i have a liquid coolant uh, interface I have a high voltage like 350 volt uh, DC battery uh, connection is also there and different sensors like resolver, temperature and it is also connected with vehicle chassis and, uh, and with the traction motor as an actuator. So here you can see there are different sensors are there, there are the control functions are there like uh, generate uh, power supply for control board, generate power supply to sensors, motor torque control, active discharge, there are all the different functionalities of uh, MCU. And, uh, I, it is also coupled with an actuator which is the traction motor so there is the, there is a sensor there is a control function there is an actuator so now i can consider this as an item because it is also going to do a vehicle level function like tar control so this is how you have to have a high level uh, interface uh, captured in the item definition and what are the details inside your item that also need to be captured so this is one simplified diagram uh, like uh, i have a reservoir sensor the temperature sensor motor and there are IGBTs, each IGBTs are driven by uh, individual gate drivers, boots, boosters, there is a control unit, gate driver unit. So you have to also define the details of your item as well in the item definition document. 
and the network topology so what are the different systems uh, your item is uh, interacting with even that information also should be captured and what are the legal requirements your item has to comply with a few examples i have captured like i need to comply with ecr 85 ecr 100 ecrrr so these are the different uh, legal requirements uh, my mc item has to comply so this information also should be there in your item definition document and what are the assumptions on external components like i am expecting the OEM will provide a cyclic MCU torque command with the required acyl integrity. I'm expecting the VCU crash, sorry, I'm expecting the crash signal with the E2V capability. So these are all certain assumptions I have for external components. Also, uh, in the item definition, you have to define what are the assumptions you have for driver level, vehicle level, and that system level also. Uh, so during the start, the starting point of hazard analysis also, you have to define uh, those assumptions. And uh, during the progress of your hazard analysis, you have to update this document. And once the hazard analysis is completed, you have to have list on the complete uh, assumption. This is very, very important. Uh, driver related assumptions, I already mentioned, like I am not, I am considering that the driver is in appropriate condition to drive the vehicle. I am not going to consider the uh, uh, driver fault behavior as a hazard analysis. I didn't consider those as well. So I clearly defined here. And uh, the vehicle load assumptions, like uh, I'm considering the vehicle to be fitted with park brake because I have certain dependency with my EPT system. So I consider the target vehicle to be fitted with park brake. And the target vehicles also I'm expecting to be fitted with an EPAS system. And also one vehicle assumption I have is uh, in my HARA analysis, I considered only if my MCU system is going to fail, uh, if there is a malfunction in my MCU system, what, what is the hazard it is going to influence? I only consider th that aspect. I, I didn't consider uh, the aspects like uh, what if my MCU system is failed along with the, the braking system or the steering system is failed. I didn't consider those aspects. That is also clearly defined in the vehicle assumptions. And what are the system level assumptions? Few examples I have listed. Like I am expecting, uh, since we are dealing with the 32 volt system, the high voltage components uh, should meet uh, ECR 100 regulations. Like appropriate uh, coloring uh, should be there, appropriate stickers should be there. All the high voltage connectors should have finger proof. So these are the uh, system level requirements I'm having. Also, there is something like uh, the fluid uh, list uh, from the high voltage battery. It should not enter into the passenger component. So this is one uh, system level requirements I considered. So now we defined the item. We have a proper item definition document ready. Next, one important aspect is we have to list down what are the functionalities we achieve at vehicle level. Few uh, vehicle level functionalities of MCU I have considered like provide positive mechanical power, which is like provide acceleration functionality, provide negative mechanical power, which is nothing but regenerative braking. So most of us know that uh, unlike conventional vehicles, electric powertrain can accelerate a vehicle as well as it can decelerate the vehicle. So most of your braking uh, cycle will, in the electric vehicle, most of the braking cycle will be done by powertrain only. Uh, so provide negative mechanical power is one of the aspects. Provide information to other systems, like uh, I need to publish the motor speed, the motor torque, uh, motor operating mode information to others. So this, are, this is one vehicle uh, function I need to comply. And the high voltage interlock uh, function, like high voltage connection. So you have to, like this, we have to list on all the uh, vehicle functions provided by your item. Then you have to choose the appropriate uh, uh, hazard analysis methodology. So uh, in our organization, we are following function failure analysis. So let's see how uh, the function failure analysis need to be performed. So you have to pick a particular vehicle or function. So in this case, we have taken like provide negative mechanical power, like provide uh, regenerative braking is a vehicle level function. <clears throat> so you have to define the failure states, like what are the failure modes? So, so these are the failure modes uh, we have considered in our function failure analysis, like undemanded, excessive, insufficient, uh, reversed, late, yearly, so like this. So you should have a set of failure modes. Next, what you have to do is these failure modes need to be applied to the function. So undemanded is my failure mode. Provide negative mechanical power is my uh, function. Uh, so if you are applying this failure mode to this function, you will get function failure, which is undemanded negative mechanical power, excessive negative mechanical power, inception negative mechanical power, reversed in this case. So negative mechanical power provided in the sense opposite to the record. Uh, so this is also a function failure. So now, once you identify the function failure, you have to identify the hazards. 
So what will happen if there is an undemanded uh, regenerative braking? So it will cause excessive vehicle deceleration, right? Uh, like excessive vehicle braking. Also, if the braking effect, if it is very high, it can also lead to excessive vehicle lateral movement or yaw movement of the vehicle. So insufficient uh, negative mechanical power will lead to insufficient uh, vehicle braking from the electric powertrain. So similarly for reverse failure mode, uh, what is going to happen is that the vehicle is going to accelerate instead of uh, decelerations. Like the driver wants to apply brake, he is applying brake. So this request is going to my motor control unit, but my motor control unit goes crazy. Like instead of uh, uh, braking, uh, if just a simple change in torque sign request uh, will result in braking uh, acceleration request instead of a braking. So vehicle accelerates when deceleration is required. So these are the different uh, vehicle level hazards just by applying the failure modes for one particular function. So like this, you have to apply the failure modes for all your uh, functions. So you, ha you have to come up with a list of hazards applicable at the vehicle level. You have to consolidate the hazards and you have to remove the duplicates. Uh, yeah, then you will be getting the consolidated uh, hazards applicable to your item. So now the hazards are also available. Next, what you have to do is uh, you have to take a particular hazard. You have to perform hazard analysis and risk assessment. So a few examples uh, from our work. So here we have chosen, uh, <coughs> chosen is excessive uh, or unintended vehicle deceleration is the hazard we have considered for uh, MCU. So my request is each hazard, each hazard hara line item you define with the unique identifier so that it's easy to track. So this particular hazard need to be mapped against the speed category. Like what, what should be the speed I should consider? Here I'm considering a medium speed ca category. Medium speed category in the sense, less than 65 kph speed, less than 60 kph speed I'm considering. Then you have to define what is the operation situation I need to consider. Here the operation situation I consider is, uh, I'm driving in an urban environment, like city driving at a medium speed with another vehicle following at the rear. So this is my operation situation, okay. So what is the operating mode I have to consider? So operating mode, as I mentioned before, whether I am playing accelerator or whether I apply brake. So those are all the operating modes. So in this case, I am just applying accelerator, like there is a steady speed of uh, acceleration. Now you have to define the exposure. Okay, so what will be the probability of a person to be in this specific situation? So a person driving in an urban environment at a steady speed with another vehicle following at the back. So this is a very highly probable situation, right? So we identified this is definitely going to be a highly probable situation. You have to select which should be the ex exposure type. The exposure type, as I mentioned, we have duration based and frequency based. In this particular case, there should be a hazard. The hazard should happen within a predefined time, time or the hazard is even to occur. So in that case, you have to apply duration based only. That would be the most appropriate one. So I, we have chosen duration based. Now there is an hazard. There is an operation situation, so you will get an hazardous event. The hazardous event is excessive deceleration of host vehicle while driving in urban environment with the other vehicle following at the back. Okay, we got the hazardous event as well. So what will be the consequence of this? <coughs> the consequence uh, for this is uh, we know uh, unlike conventional vehicle where conventional uh, powertrains uh, it can only provide tractor in electric vehicle. Uh, if, I'm, if my electric powertrain is capable of achieving 10 meter per second square acceleration, it is equally capable of achieving the deceleration. Like if I'm able to achieve zero to 100 within five seconds, I'm able to achieve the same thing. Uh, means I'm able to apply the same amount of deceleration as well. So here the consequence can be, uh, if this much, the my electric power, I'm expecting the electric powertrain, if it is small function, I mean, if it is fully delivering the full torque, it can go up to more than 0.60, which is like six meter per second square deceleration. Also, we have to be, we have to understand here, like the braking is not done by brake system. It is done by powertrain, so there will not be brake light illumination as well. So the consequence for this is uh, the host vehicle may brake the path of the following vehicle without a proper illumination of brake lights, right? Uh, so what will be the description of severity since it's a medium speed driving, like less than 60 kph driving, uh, and you are driving in a city road, so definitely the collision will result in a severe injury, but not a kind of a death related scenarios. So we, we can rate it as S2 based on the injury level. So description of controllability. <clears throat> so the controllability here we can see is in urban environment, uh, you, you will not maintain uh, 
high safe distance right like you mostly you will maintain a 2 seconds safe distance uh, scenarios only so like you will be driving very closely so most of the times uh, the rear vehicle driver will be surprised with this incident so you will not be able to apply brake immediately to avoid this hazard also the brake lights are also not illuminated in this case so it is definitely going to be c3 so the exposure e4 s2 s sorry svrt s2 and controllability c3 which results in acyl c so this unintended vehicle deceleration if it is going to be influenced uh, by the power train uh, because of its small function it can pose a, a acyl violation of acyl c <clears throat> one more example excessive vehicle lateral or uh, yaw moment of the vehicle so for this i have chosen a speed category of a high speed uh, because uh, the operation situation i consider is i am driving in a highway the operating mode i am applying accelerator pedal uh, to drive the vehicle like vehicle is accelerating and what is the description for exposure like a person uh, driving a vehicle in a highway with 100 to 100 100 to 120 kph speed this is a very highly probable situation right also in this particular use case you need to have a hazard to happen within a specific time for the hazard is even to take place so here also duration based will be the most appropriate one so e4 uh, so here this is the most frequent situation so this will be a e4 and the hazard is even so we have a hazard and the operation situation so with this the hazard is even will be like the excessive very high negative torque uh, of the host vehicle when i am turning at a high speed uh, so if that torque is going to be a very peak uh, very high torque so it can even lock your wheels so based on the uh, type of drive if it is a front wheel drive vehicle it is going to affect the steerability if it is going if it is going to be a rear uh, drive vehicle you are completely going to spin the vehicle because it is going to lock your rear axle you know right in automotive always your front wheels has to stop first compared to your rear wheels that's the reason you have this ebd all those functions are there uh, in our vehicle right so it is just going to spin your vehicle if it is a rear rear wheel drive vehicle so what will be the consequence the consequence uh, what we have understood is uh, the host vehicle may because there is a very high negative torque and if and it's uh, going to be a rear axle drive vehicle so it, it is just going to spin the vehicle so host vehicle may deviate uh, from the path and there is a possibility of uh, front end collision or head end collision or there can be possibility of side uh, collision as well so here what what is the severity uh, since it's high speed and it is going to be a head on collision it can cause an life threatening uh, injury like uh, even the survival it can cause death kind of scenarios so here i have rated severity as s3 and what will be the controllability uh, the controllability left there is nothing left to the driver right because uh, you are unintentionally applying brake and the wheels are already locked there is already a stability loss is there so and you are already at high speed so the vehicle is just spinning nothing you can do in this situation you can just sit and watch <laughs> what is going to happen so <clears throat> there is nothing left to the driver for controllability so the controllability ratio here is c3 so here you can see the excessive vehicle lateral area moment induced by the <clears throat> this particular hazard uh, so the exposure it can pose e4 CVRT S3 and controllability C, so it can result in acyl D. <clears throat> so we understood. So we defined the item. We understood what are the things need to be there, and we have chosen a methodology how to perform uh, hazard analysis. We performed complete hara. We identified it. Uh, we uh, determined the acyl rating for two hazards like excessive vehicle deceleration and excessive vehicle which is acyl C and excessive vehicle uh, unintended yaw moment of the vehicle. next we have to develop the safety goal so what is the safety goal safety goals are nothing so even the safety goal related aspects are also covered in part 3 of the iso standard the safety goals are nothing but they are the top level safety requirements and they are uh, uh, derived from the hazard analysis and risk assessment and they should be at the vehicle level <clears throat> so uh, we know uh, that you are going to apply uh, function failure analysis uh, to individual hazards so you may come up with the different safety goals so if there are similar safety goals are there you can combine those safety goals into single one but you have to provide the highest acyl to those safety goals so this is also quite important you need to have a same safety goal with the different acyls so you can combine those safety goals and you can assign the highest acyl to that safety goal as well <clears throat> so what are the 
fact uh, parameters should be associated with the safety code so just uh, simply defining avoid uh, uh, too low drive torque avoid too high drive torque doesn't make any sense so you have to define the fault tolerance time interval and the physical characteristics associated with the safety code like uh, <coughs> I will cover this aspect of the slides. Uh, so, like the physical characteristics uh, uh, is nothing. Uh, so, th those are the fault amplitudes. Like uh, uh, those aspects need to be defined in the safety goal. If, uh, if there is a possibility, you can even define the safety goal also, safe, safe state also along with safety goal. So, normally uh, in my experience, we define safe state along with uh, function safety requirements, but uh, it's, uh, it, it's also okay to define safe state. Uh, under a safety goal, like safe state is nothing but uh, this operating mode in case of failure of an item without an unreasonable level of risk. What it is trying to say is, uh, say for example, if there is an excessive acceleration hazard happening in my vehicle, either I can completely stop the vehicle, so or I can provide a limited uh, torque function like limpo mode. So these two are the safe states. But I have to make sure that in this safe state there are no unreasonable risk. So if there is one more failure happens or if there is a pre-existing failure is still continuing, I should make sure that there is it is not going to cause any hazardous event. So that is what safe state means. So fault tolerance time interval. <clears throat> the fault tolerance time interval uh, it's a very big topic. Like we can discuss this fault tolerance time interval itself for one and a half hour. So with respect to ISO, what it means is it's the minimum time span from the occurrence of a fault in an item to the possible occurrence of a hazardous event. So my understanding. So, so what this really means is, uh, if there is a fault happening in your item, so how much time the fault can be allowed to stay in your in your item? So before the hazardous event to take place, so that particular time span you are going to keep the fault, right? Like for your debouncing, detection, confirmation, uh, safe state by software, safe state initiation by software, safe state initiation by hardware. So. All, all this thing, it should happen within the fault tolerance time interval. So I think in uh, part one, I guess, in part one, previously, uh, if you look at edition one, there are no proper explanation given related to fault tolerance time interval. But if you look at edition two, proper explanations are given. Also, some examples are also given. So in fault tolerance time interval, basically, you need to have fault detection time. You need to define fault detection time, fault uh, reaction time, fault handling time, debouncing time. So all those aspects need to be considered in fault tolerance time interval. So safety goal hierarchy. Uh, so a safety goal, from our experience, like we have seen, many to many relationships are possible. Like one hazard may be mapped to multiple safety goals. Similarly, one safety goal may mitigate multiple hazards. Like uh, excessive acceleration is one of the hazard. Excessive acceleration with park brake engaged. This is also one of the hazard we considered. But both these hazards can be mitigated by the same safety goal related to excessive acceleration. So I need, need to have a separate safety goal for these two different hazards. So one safety goal may mitigate uh, many hazards. So that is possible. So this same many to many uh, relationship is also possible between safety goals and function safety requirements as well. Like uh, one safety goal may be uh, one safety goal may be linked to uh, Different function safety requirements or single function safety requirement uh, may mitigate many safety goals. That also uh, is possible. So, how a safety goal structure should look like? So, just like uh, another safety requirement, because safety goal is nothing but it's the top level safety requirement, right? Yeah, the safety goal should be atomic, simple, like it should be consistent. It should be consistent with your system requirements and other aspects. It should be clear, complete, and verifiable. Let's try to understand this with our example. With this example, so this is from one of our safety goal. <clears throat> the MCU system shall not cause the vehicle to accelerate relative to driver demand by more than TBD meter per second square average to over XXX seconds. So here TBD, we, uh, we have a fault amplitude. And the XXX defines the fault tolerance time interval. But considering the confidence perspective, I am not putting those values here. So if you look at this particular example, uh, if you are defining a safety goal, you have to make sure that it should have an unique identifier. It should have an item name. So which item uh, you are uh, really focusing here in this case, it's an MCU. And uh, we should have a clear indication when the safety goal need to be fulfilled. Here I have clearly mentioned that this excessive acceleration need to be fulfilled related to the driver demand at all. So this aspect also need to be considered in the safety goal. 
and definitely the asyl indication is also mandatory like you it, it should have an asyl <clears throat> so next topic is uh, safety goals uh, as safety envelopes based on risk so in the previous slide we discussed uh, two topics right fault tolerance time interval and uh, uh, fault amplitude like the physical characteristics so uh, <clears throat> uh, so why these are all really important Let's consider like the excessive acceleration case. So let's try to understand from this graph. Uh, if the excessive acceleration happens, uh, say for example, uh, there is a malfunction in the water control unit, and it starts to deliver a peak torque of uh, 350 Newton meter. But if the 350 Newton meter, if it is going to happen only for 50 milliseconds, what is going to happen? So nothing is going to happen, right? There won't even be a jerk felt by the driver. But if the same peak torque delivery, if it is going to happen 200 milliseconds, then it is going to subdue. Then you may feel little amount of acceleration, but just, but it won't cause any hazardous event. But if the same peak torque delivery, if it is going to continue for more than 500 milliseconds or one second, it is going to cause an hazardous event. So a hazard is always not critical. The hazard criticality is defined based on how much time it is going to continue in the vehicle. So the, that plays a major role uh, in, uh, with respect to the kind of harm it is going to influence. So this is with respect to the timing. So that's why that's that's why FTTA plays an important role uh, in safety goal identification. Similarly, uh, let's come to fault amplitude. So if if the excessive acceleration uh, happens, uh, like there is a malfunction in the MCU and it is going to deliver a peak tar. And because of that, you are going to get 0.1 meter per second square moment, or 0.1 meter per second square acceleration, right? So 0.1 meter per second square acceleration, if you translate it, how much it will be? It will be like 10 centimeter moment, right? So if this is a kind of uh, acceleration, it is going to influence what is going to happen. Nothing is going to happen. But if the same malfunction, if it is going to cause one meter per second square acceleration scenarios, this means like you will be moving one meter within a second. So this may hit a pedestrian or a bicyclist when you are standing in a traffic signal. So your fault amplitude uh, also matters with respect to uh, uh, the injury level and uh, the acid determination. So your safety goal should always be associated with an FTT and a fault amplitude. Because if the timing is very less, if it is going to happen within 10 milliseconds, if the fault is going to continue in the vehicle for only 10 milliseconds or 50 milliseconds, it is not going to do anything. And if the uh, excessive acceleration or excessive acceleration value is also very less. It is not going to cause a really hazard. So this acyl uh, graph, when so this acyl range is going to be increased based on the timing and the fault amplitude. <clears throat> so the, uh, so there will be some common mistakes that we do in defining the safety goal, like the top level safety recommend. So one common mistake I have seen is like uh, the safety goals are too vague. Like if you see here, the EPD system shall avoid inappropriate acceleration during driving. So if you define a safety goal like this, so if uh, when you are developing a system level requirements, uh, or if as an OEM, if I'm providing a safety goal like this to my tire and supplier, it will definitely lead to confusion, right? So what is this inappropriate? Whether too low acceleration is inappropriate or too high acceleration is inappropriate. Obviously, too low acceleration is not going to cause uh, much hazard, right? Only too high acceleration. So you have to clearly define uh, the safety goal. The safety goal should not be too vague. The other one aspect is uh, just uh, simply defining a safety goal related to hazard, like uh, EPD system shall avoid excessive deceleration. Just simply uh, defining like this, like just in hazard. This is too general to be useful, right? So like uh, in EPD system, like electric powertrain system, most of the time the regenerative braking will be used as a, a performance thing to increase the efficiency of the vehicle. It is not so if if the regenerative braking is failed, still the driver can press the um, full brake pedal to get the deceleration. So always we consider the hazard induced by the braking system. If it is within a threshold, like uh, we are only keeping 0.3 G or 0.1 G regenerative braking only, we are going to provide at the vehicle only means that is always considered as QM. So you have to properly define uh, the fault on time interval and the fault amplitude along with the safety goal. Just you should not define only the hazards. And the safety goals uh, that give specific design choice. Also, we should not be over smart as well. Like we, 
defining a safety code like this the esp system shall read a, a pressure sensor value from a redundant pressure uh, sensor and avoid commenting the pump motor so if you define a very detailed safety uh, safety code like this so there is no flexibility left to the driver uh, flexibility le left to the system designer uh, right uh, uh, because uh, there the system designer can choose whether he is going to fulfill this particular safety requirement with a single pr pressure sensor or three pressure sensor four pressure sensor or with a different uh, technology so uh, that decision should be left to the system designer only so we should not define a safety goal in a detailed way like this so some examples <coughs> uh, from our work uh, like how we have defined uh, the safety goals like the top level safety requirements so it should be always associated with the ninth fair the mc system shall not cause the vehicle to accelerate related to driver demand by more than uh, this uh, fault amplitude average power uh, fault all the time interval with slb so this is the sa this safety goal is with respect to uh, acceleration excessive or unneeded acceleration the below safety goal is related to excessive or unneeded vehicle deceleration also that we have a safety goal for like the mc system shall not cause the vehicle to experience a deviation by uh, more than tpd degree average to over uh, this this much fault on time and tone from the driver internal path on a dry road surface with SLT. So these are a few examples from our uh, safety goals. We have nearly like 13 safety goals defined only for MCU. So overall EPT level, we have nearly 30 safety goals defined. So uh, like here you can see it clearly has an uh, unique kind fair which system I am uh, <coughs> focusing that is also there. What should be the appropriate condition I have to define that is there. It has a fault tolerance time interval. Fault amplitude is there. It is also associated with SLT. So this will be really useful uh, for the next uh, level work. So the final uh, topic of this session, like how the FSC is achieved. Uh, basically from the hazard analysis and risk assessment, uh, uh, you will be getting the hazards along with the asset then you will be developing the safety goals then from that uh, you will be defining the function safety concept with the function safety requirements right so basically in function safety requirements you will be defining the detailed safe states the emergency operation time interval the fault tolerance time interval all those aspects so basically function safety concept is nothing but what needs to be done to achieve the safety goal so that will be defined in the function safety concept so the technical safety requirements and the technical safety concept, uh, this will be like how um, it is going to be achieved, how it will be done. So technical safety requirements are quite detailed uh, system level requirements. So then from the technical safety requirements, we have to define the hardware safety requirements and software safety requirements. Basically, the HSRs and the SSRs are the coordinations of uh, the hardware and software features uh, to achieve the safety functionalities. So I guess uh, this function safety concept, technical safety concept, uh, uh, related derivations, I think, will be covered in the next uh, session. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> so with that, uh, come to the end. I guess uh, this session is quite useful. Uh, like we understood uh, the hazard uh, and what are the different methods in anything hazard? What are the steps we have to follow? how item definition should look like, detail, hara, what are the different aspects we have to consider, and how a top load safety requirement uh, will be identified. I think all those aspects are covered in this session. Uh, so uh, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Maheshwaran. So participants, do you have any questions? You can uh, ask them one by one. Uh, hi, Maheshwaran. Hi. This is uh, Ramya here. Hi, Ramya. Uh, so thanks for that great session. Uh, it was really good. So I have this question. It's a very good question. I'm trying to understand what's the difference uh, or how is item, system, uh, element, subsystem, uh, function, feature, all of this related? It, it would be nice if you could give an example and tell me the uh, difference on how it is related. Like if you could give, say, braking system, then you can just say uh, what is what in that. Okay, uh, maybe I think I covered uh, in the starting. Which, uh, maybe I will present it again. Uh, no, no, it's fine. I I got that part. Uh, mm -hmm. but uh, I I just want to know if if okay if okay. I take. Uh, let's understand this. Uh, I think uh, yeah. are you able to see the screen? 
so this yeah, yeah, is my electric power train this example is my electric power train so here if you see there is a actuator pedal sensor there is a control mm-hmm. unit there is a motor which is an actuator so okay the iso what it says is uh, you can define a system when you are defining a system at least you should have an sensor mm-hmm. control controller and there is an actuator okay so you can okay. see my epd system fulfills this there is an actuator pedal sensor with this i am getting a driver demand driver uh, demanded request then my motor control unit is going to set the torque demand and the motor is going to uh, deliver uh, the torque so with this i am able to achieve a vehicle roll function which is a vehicle acceleration functionality so okay. if this is fulfilled you can call a particular e product as a system when you can call this system as an item the iso has given clear direction like you can call a system as an item if yeah. this system is going to achieve a vehicle roll function okay so in in this case with this particular setup i am able to achieve a vehicle function which is acceleration of the vehicle mm-hmm. uh, is achieved so i can call this system as an item say for example in our vehicle we have this gateway issues where it just uh, take the can signals and it passes right so it doesn't yeah, yeah. need to achieve any vehicle roll function so you can't consider gateway issue as a item you can't consider oh. that as one a system so like this you may have several examples in the vehicles so this is how you have to distinguish between system and item this dis- distinction is very very important in hazard analysis you should not take yeah, a, yeah. you should not wrongly take a system as an item okay yeah und- understood uh, maheshwaran another question uh, i wanted to know how how do you uh, uh, classify the boundary in an item because when we were when you were doing item definition uh, did you consider all the inputs and the outputs in the uh, boundary yes uh, we need to consider the inputs and the outputs not only the uh, signal chains uh, you need to consider the interfaces the complete interfaces like what are the mechanical interfaces i have what are the electrical interfaces i have if there is any hydraulic or pneumatic interfaces all the interfaces not only the signal related interfaces say for example uh, in this i have okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So this which would be the boundary? So are you able to see my screen? I think my okay. okay. So here, uh, this is my boundary. Like here in this. Uh, boundary diagram i have defined means we have very detailed boundary diagram so unfortunately i am not able to present uh, that thing this is a simplified uh, form of our boundary diagram so basically i have considered uh, the me- mechanical interfaces like the electric interface like even the 2 volt power supply uh, high voltage uh, connections and there is a connection with the traction motor and how this connections will be even those aspects are also considered along with the sensor interfaces in some of our system you need to consider the uh switches also right say for example if you are working on braking system you need to consider the part of switch uh, epp switches so in our system we don't have such switches so basically all the interfaces yeah. you need to consider not only the signal uh, interfaces okay yeah yeah i understood thank you so much mahesh thank you uh, hi mahesh uh, this is abul uh, i have a question in slide number 8 uh, uh, you have told uh, identifying the failure modes right So in that, uh, what is FHA and can you uh, explain it? No, FHA is nothing but a function hazard analysis. Mm-hmm. Uh, so in our organization, we call this as function failure analysis, and uh, the same uh, methodology only we are using for our hazard identification. So that function failure analysis is mainly to identify the hazards. So I think my example, this example I have shown, right? Uh, how I am, I, I have identified hazards in my system. So mm-hmm. this is basically a function failure analysis only. So you need to have okay. a list of failure modes. We have to apply these failure modes to the functions of your item. Okay. Okay. So once you apply these failure modes to your uh, functions, you will get first function failures. So for example, if I am applying undemanded to yeah. a function failure of a negative mechanical power, I will get a function failure undemanded negative mechanical power. Yeah, correct. With yeah. that, if uh, I am analyzing, I will get the vehicle level hazards. Yes, Mahesh. So uh, here, then, because uh, uh, the method, whatever you are telling here, looks like a hazard keywords. 
So what is the uh, difference between the Hazov analysis, like uh, in identifying the failure modes, what is the difference between FHA and I think there is some disturbance. Yeah, uh, so yeah, you can go, go continue now, Mr. Uh, yes, uh, Mahesh. So, uh, what is the difference between the Hazop method and the FHA method? So, uh, the difference I said, like, I, uh, I, I haven't really worked on the Hazop analysis. We have worked only on the functional failure analysis. So, the Hazop method, uh, my understanding is, uh, it, it is more or less similar like the function failure analysis, but uh, whereas you will mostly define the uh, malfunction behaviors of your item. So I don't have much uh, understanding on the Hazop analysis. Oh, okay, no issues. Thanks, thanks, Mahesh, for your uh, session and the uh, uh, clarification of the route. Thanks. Uh, hello, hello Mahesh. Mahesh. I have one uh, question. Here. Hello. Hi. Uh, hi, this is Dinesh. So I have one question. Like uh, previously, you have explained that uh, item uh, and uh, system differentiation, like a central gateway, so is not an item and it's a system which is considered as a system. So, uh, I, I, as you know, so even in central gateway also, we are applying the functional safety. So, in this case, if we are not considering as an item, then uh, how can we implement safety and derive the functional safety goals? Yeah, so uh, basically what you have to do is uh, you, you have to analyze the interfaces and the outputs, right? So the yes. user who's using uh, the gateway issue outputs, so that user, he will be analyzing the, I mean, so he will be analyzing all the suspects and he will be providing if some signal, right? uh, uh, like If Hello? some signals required with actual integrity, then in that case, uh, central gateway also should deliver those signals with... Uh, ah, in, that, as, in, the, in the case, you have to consider that as an SEOC. Safety okay. element out of context. Yes. If I mean, you are developing a system a gateway for a particular vehicle, then you can't apply item definition and all this thing. You can't consider that as an item, right? But whereas uh, you are not going to specifically develop for a particular vehicle, like I am going to uh, 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 develop this uh, gateway for um, uh, some North American OEM, something like that. If you are not considering like that, you have to develop that as an SEOC where you will have a set of assumptions. In that case, you can't call uh, this gateway as an item. So, okay. So actually, if you are uh, doing the uh, HARA uh, at the vehicle level, so you have several issues. So in this case, uh, you are going to an analyze the safety goals through for the, all the systems, right? If in that case, uh, item means all the issues considered as the item. Is that correct? So, you know, in that case, not all the issues are considered as, a, as an item. Say, for example, if your gateway issue is going to interact with the braking system mm -hmm. or uh, electric powertrain system, the electric powertrain system is capable of achieving a vehicle level function on its own with a sensor, controller, and actuator, then the uh, EPT, uh, EPT system alone can be considered as an item. So, when the EPT uh, tire one uh, supplier, when he is uh, analyzing the uh, when he is developing the item definition document and he is performing the hazard analysis, he will come up with the list of safety requirements which he is expecting from the gateway issue. Then he will be cascading all those requirements to you. So this is how normally it will work. Yeah, I understand about this. So let's uh, put aside of this uh, central gateway. So if you are doing the hara from the vehicle point of view, there will be different ECUs. So in this case, if you want to achieve some functionality with SLD at the vehicle level, so you have the flexibility to distribute to the different ECUs. So in this case, uh, sometimes I heard that uh, acid decomposition can be done, like uh, if it is acid functionality, some ECU can be implemented with uh, QM and other ECU, acid D or acid B or acid B. So is that uh, how uh, uh, you are distribute to that kind of decomposition? Yeah, okay. but uh, it, no, it is not that simple uh, slides. In, in simple, like uh, an ECU, which is connected to an actuator, even though you are applying decomposition, uh, like many places, if you have applied decomposition, the ECU which is connected to a particular actuator, that particular issue definitely you have to put, uh, develop with SLT only. Say, for example, if I'm working on unintended uh, deceleration related thing, the unintended deceleration 
is pro, uh, generated by the brake circuit from, from the pump motor. The which the issue which is connected with this pump motor, it has to be developed with SLC only, irrespective of uh, what level of SLT combustion you have applied. Okay, understand. And my last question is so. Uh, in some OEMs, like um, uh, some OEMs, so they will give some functional safety requirements, and some OEMs will not give uh, functional safety requirements to the tire ones. So, is Mahindra Electric is deriving the functional safety requirements through the safety goals and giving to the OEM uh, tire ones, or yeah. it's only giving the safety goals? Yeah, exactly. Like uh, this, this is the most uh, likely scenario. Like uh, mostly tire one supplier performs the hazard analysis, and fitting the hazards having the safety goals and uh, you have to uh, discuss with your customer whether the hazard uh, hazards you have considered and your risk assessment the safety goals you derived it is in line to them or not i have seen only very few oems in my experience i have seen that they are in a position to deliver the safety goals uh, most of the cases it is the responsibility of the tire one uh, supplier okay thank you thank you Mahesh. Hello, Mahesh. Uh, Nihal here. Yes. Uh, so, uh, regarding controllability assessment, I had one question. Uh, mm -hmm. For C1 and C3, it is uh, understood by me, but uh, assessing C2 controllability, it is a little bit difficult for uh, me also. And uh, 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 in standard, they have also given some notes uh, and guidelines over it that uh, uh, they, uh, there is a mention of a response free document. And some test scenario that 20 valid uh, data sets need to be performed. So uh, the so my question is, have you came across any uh, scenario where uh, you have assessed the controllability at C2, and uh, how how was the justification behind it? Yeah. <clears throat> uh, so I will provide this uh, situation like uh, so we are driving you are driving in a urban environment like the city driving situation. So what will the speed you will be driving? You will be driving at a 45, um, like less than 40 kph speed, right? Yeah. So like you are standing in front of traffic light and the pedestrians uh, are crossing in front of you. So there is a malfunction in your electric power train and it starts delivering torque. Uh, so what will be your reaction for this particular use case? Mm -hmm. Generally, uh, I, I will try to find any uh, uh, breaking uh, uh, position like uh, anywhere yeah, exactly. I can get nearby. Exactly, you are right. So here, when I'm assessing uh, a hazard, excessive acceleration hazard, so the severity. Obviously, if I'm going to hit the pedestrian, he is going to have a life-threatening injury. It is going to be S3 only. The exposure driving in urban environment, it is a very highly probable scenario. Now mm -hmm. I have to rate the controllability, whether it is going to be C3 or C2. This is going to be a matter. So this okay. situation. It is quite easily controllable, right? Easily controllable in the sense, uh, even the standard has given like uh, between 90 to 99 percent of the driver will be able to control the situation, right? Because you are already at standstill speed, um, mm -hmm. uh, like you are already at standstill. There is an unintended uh, acceleration provided by the system. Most of the uh, user, what they will do, they will apply brake to control the vehicle at least immediately. So it is not like a difficult to control situation. In this case, it is normally controllable situation only. So and you can rate C2 in this particular use case. The C1, the example which I gave is like uh, the power window example, right? So like, uh, so you are trying to, uh, the driver is trying to control a particular window, but uh, the passenger is putting his hand on the window. So if the window is lifting, he can easily take his hand uh, to avoid the harm. So those kind of situations can be simply controlled. Mm, yeah, yes, understood. These are uh, some justification done after an expert judgment or maybe an industry experience. But uh, uh, as a tire one supplier, we need to give a, uh, evidence for it uh, uh, for, for the controllability rating. And uh, IS also speaks in in the notes uh, uh, below this uh, table B six. So, mm -hmm. uh, ha have you came across anything? Uh, uh, so we can provide justifications. Uh... Certain use cases, yes, we can provide justification, but not always. So this particular uh, cases, what we can show is like uh, we can show uh, some simulation results. Uh, like uh, so, this is my peak torque. So this is my cavity of my electric motor, 
and the, from standstill speed if i am delivering uh, the, the peak torque this much will be the maximum movement and this much will be the reaction time and uh, yeah so this much response time is left so mm -hmm. this is my brake pressure braking system capability uh, so like that you have to have a, a detailed uh, things for all the things but normally this will be very very difficult to have for each and every hazard line item. So most in our hazard analysis, mostly we consider the rational only. Whether the situation whether we consider it makes sense or not. In the unneeded acceleration happens with the pedestrian crossing in front of you. Whether most of the drivers will be able to apply brake pedal to control the situation or not. If this is yes, then we will proceed. Okay. Okay, 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 understood. Uh, so everything we, we can't for all the situations uh, we can't uh, provide. Uh, uh, like uh, backup thing because if you look at our hara we have nearly 113 line of line items so if, mm -hmm. if you come up with a simulation cases for all the things so that itself will be like a two two year worth of time yep yeah, that is true uh, but standard only expect uh, uh, evidence to be provided for a c2 class not for everything okay okay maybe, maybe uh, offline you can go through the yeah. response three document and uh, maybe uh, in future uh, uh, seminars, if you can uh, give uh, uh, guidelines to yeah, us, yeah, so uh, I, it will yeah. be helpful. Yeah, yeah thank so you. So we have done simulations for certain use cases. That is also there. Uh, but uh, mm -hmm. this particular C2 aspect, I will see. OK, yeah. Hi, Mahesh. Uh, this is Upendra. Three. Hi, Upendra. I have, a, I have a one question. Uh, thanks for the session, actually. But uh, my understanding, when we are developing CEOC safety element out of the concept, so we will not consider the system context, right? Then what could be the item for it, either for the software or hardware? No, uh, so there you will be considering the boundaries, everything. If you look at uh, this SEOC related information, I think it is captured in part 10, right? So there, even the standard clearly mentions uh, when you are developing SEOC, you can't call your system boundary as an item because you can only consider an item if you are if you are developing a system for a targeted vehicle yes uh, but uh, if i am developing a software then i can i can be having a functions right and i can map a boundary i can develop a boundary diagram too so can i consider those like a item for it or there will be so, a no item you know, when you are developing see seoc it can be at different level. SEOC can be at a system level. SEOC can be at a hardware level. SEOC can be at a software level. So if you are working on SEOC with respect to a software level, say for example, if you're developing some aspects of ASW module or some aspects of BSW module, that is not an item. That cannot be considered as an item. That cannot be considered as a system itself. That is an SEOC. That is a part of uh, your SEOC work. Item okay. means we should be able to achieve a vehicle function uh with that system and there should be a sensor controller and actuator associated with it and only you can call that as, that as an item so software level things will not wonder item it can be an seoc okay so uh can you suggest like can we proceed for hara and the hazard analysis for the ceo no if you are only working on software thing uh definitely is a how you will be able to work on the hara? That, 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 that is not possible, right? Yeah, because uh, my understanding is that for the CEOC, we are considering, <clears throat> let's say we are considering SLD, okay, at the system level. Uh -huh. So, for suppose if I am having uh, two different issues which are like uh, SLB and SLD also. So, uh, then uh, there will be, a, we, can, we can't trace uh, requirements, right? Yeah. Uh, see, when you are working on software and if you don't have any reference to your system, then you can't perform hazard analysis because for hazard analysis, you need to have an interface like what are the sensors, controllers, and actuators involved here. Okay, but you, even if you are developing a software uh, element, which is developed as an SEOC, but if you are able to develop, if you have if you have an assumptions of systems available, like you have a boundary diagram, assumed boundary diagram available, assumed system or requirements available, then you can uh, perform a hazard analysis for them. Just simply, like if you have only a software requirements, with that you will not be able to perform any hazard analysis. Okay. Thanks, Mitch. Yeah.
Hello. Yep. Yeah. Uh, my question is regarding safe gate. Uh, suppose if I am having a functionality like a cluster display, and if uh, the fault is happening on the cluster display, I have my safe gate as uh, displaying the the important information on passenger display or central display. Yes. So do, uh, do we need to make sure that uh, this passenger display as well as the central display is working properly without any faults? Similar to cluster display, like we need to add, uh, we need to analyze in the same way as cluster display, like adding proper safety mechanisms to identify if all this happening. Um, it, to understand your question, whether the cluster related instrument cluster related thing also comes under safety, is that is your question? Yeah, uh, the cluster yes. display is a is a is a safe is a safety item, uh, it's a safety functionality, and suppose if a fault has happened in the cluster display. And uh, so, uh, as, a, as my safe state, I will be displaying the uh, the information on the passenger display. So, mm -hmm. do we need to make sure that the passenger unit is also working properly, similar to the cluster display, like adding the safety mechanisms and uh, analyzing the same as cluster display? No, uh, it depends on what is uh, the ACL level of your primary uh, instrument. Is like if it is uh, ACL B, like you need to only uh, fulfill ACL B. Uh, yeah. Then you need to consider this because already uh, already there should be a, some system failure should be there, right? Okay. Then yeah. uh, you are going to inform uh, in the instrument cluster. Now what already what we are talking is a secondary failure, like instrument cluster okay. is also failed. So again okay. you are going to provide in, in a one more secondary instrument cluster. There it's a third failure. So basically if you look at standard, order greater than two can be considered as a safe state, safe failure. Like if the two or more failure happens, then only your safety code is going to be violated. Uh, then you can consider that as a safe fault if a proper rationale is given. In that case, you now have to consider that as a uh, safety uh, element. Okay. In that case, if it's a ASL B, I don't want to have. And if it, but if it is a suppose like ASL C or ASL D level, then I need to have. No, still, uh, still, my understanding is your secondary display uh, uh, to fail needs a third failure like there should be one more and so there should be three level of failure should happen uh, if you look okay. at part five uh, so it clearly defines uh, so you, if there is an n greater than two the failure uh, is more than two uh, so mostly you can consider that failure as a safe failure you know to consider that you know any of your analysis or anything okay okay uh, thank you thank you Mahira. thank you and uh, thanks for the presentation thanks This table three is from uh, which part of ISO class of controllability? So this table three is from ISO part three. Part three, okay. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, to decide on uh, which SL levels like QM, SL, B, C, D, uh, does the fit rate will also come into picture in any of the analysis? No. Fit rate uh, doesn't uh, come into picture. I think th that's a very good question. Like I covered that in the presentation also. Like always, uh, like in the acid related, you will be diff considering the exposure of being in an operation scenario, not in the being in a hazardous event. Because uh, what is the probability of unintended acceleration uh, going to happen in an urban environment? If you are considering like this, then only the fit matters. Whereas in your acid determination, you are going to only consider the operation scenario. So your fit is not going to be mattered in the acid determination. You should not consider fit. Because you okay. are only so considering where, the operation where scenario, this not the hazardous one. Mm -hmm. Okay, where would, this, where would be this the important parameter in deciding anything? The fit rate. Um, okay, that is a different topic. Maybe I will try to answer this. Uh, so now <clears throat> your acyl determination comes as acyl D. Say for example, excessive deceleration needs to be compared with acyl D. If you look at part five, so part five has given instruction like if you are developing an acyl D hardware, you need to fulfill certain metrics related to random hardware failures, right? So the random hardware failures related to acyl D could be your SPF from single point fault metric. You need to have a 99 percentage coverage. Like all your hardware related failures, if it is going to cause a single point fault like it is going to directly violate the safety goal then 99 percentage 
single point failures in your system should be detected and a safe state should be initiated uh, by the safety mechanism. That is one requirement is there with respect to it. Along with that, you have LFO metric, like 90% of your latent point failures should be detected. Most importantly, you have the PMHF metric as well. Like you have to have a 10 feet target if it is an SLT system. So there it matters. It is there in part five. So based on SLD, uh, the PMH of metric is 10 feet. If it is an SLC, it is 100 feet. So like that, those requirements are there. Okay. okay. I think we can, uh, we are coming towards, uh, we are already overshot uh, the time. So maybe one last question we can take. Then we would like to wrap up the event. Uh, hello, Mahesh. Uh, thanks for the very informative session. Uh, maybe uh, just maybe it's a basic question, but just wanted to know that whether hazard uh, analysis Hara can also recognize the non safety relevant like through the decisions of Hara. Can we also uh, derive that these functions are non safety related? Like are QMs considered as non safety related or that is yes. a different? Yes, yes. Uh, QM is considered as non safety. Definitely in your Hara analysis, uh, you will come across a uh, non safety related. Uh, aspects as well so maybe in this particular example i have shown also it has some non safety related uh, you see here uh, inception so when i applied this function failure analysis the failure mode inception i got a inception negative mechanical power it's like inception okay. vehicle deceleration so the inception vehicle deceleration from uh, epd system perspective it is just qm because uh, we expect only regenerative braking from the vehicle and the regenerative braking will be always kept as a threshold between 0.1 to 0.3 g so if there is a regenerative braking is not there also still the driver can apply brake pedal to get the full deceleration so the inception vehicle deceleration with respect to epd system it is just qm only whereas if you look at a braking system it could be sld uh, so since it results in qm it is a non safety related and yes your hazard analysis uh, activity also can come up with non safety related things as well Okay, so there are no requirements that before Hara we uh, claim that as non safety, only after Hara we can decide that it is non safety. No, it is not directly Hara. Uh, this fa function failure analysis is one of the activity inside Hara. So, uh, so in that activity, you will be uh, because before that, the one activity left is item definition. There, definitely, you will not be able to know what are the hazards, so which are the fa function failures are safety, which are the function failures are non safety. So you have to have some analysis. It could be a function failure analysis like this, or if you have any reference project and the system FME is available, you can consider that aspect uh, as well. But definitely some analysis should be there. Without that, you can't identify. OK, yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Shall we move towards closure then? Uh, yeah, uh, Dr. Mahesh. Uh, yeah. So okay. thanks a lot.